and I curate, I curate uh, women's only spaces where we talk about sexuality, we talk about spirituality, we talk about life changes, we talk about family, reproductive health, and I'm just excited to be back talking to my girl, Naima, about uh, something that we don't talk enough about. So I'm really excited for this conversation today. I love it, sis. Now, as I said before, guys, my apologies, because I know you guys have been coming for me in the comments. And if you knew that people are talking about having a GoFundMe to support my internet, because my internet is so bad, because <laughs> everywhere I go, I'm followed by bad internet. So I would like, I don't want this anything of, you know, to, to disrupt our learning from you, inshallah. So we're going to be talking about, you're going to be talking about cycles of desire marriage, motherhood, and menopause. So I want to give you the stage, inshallah. Bismillah, sis, take it away. All right. So, um, yeah, I, I have never been um, quiet about my age. Uh, it is not something that I've ever hidden since I've been on a, a social media stage. I've been doing this work uh, in earnest since around 2001. Uh, I started in 1998 as a way to heal my own um, sexual health issues. I'm a victim of sexual assault and sexual trauma. So I really got into this work not to inform anyone else, but to heal myself. And along the way, I was in contact with women from West Africa, women uh, from the Caribbean, women from the United States, uh, older women who taught me about different ways that women heal themselves through herbs, through somatic therapy, through movement, dance. And one of the things that I noted was these were older women. I was in my early 20s. These were women in their 40s and their 50s, sometimes in their 60s. And they were fully resonant with the place that they were in their lives at that time. There was no desire for youthfulness. There was no desire to you know, get fillers or Botox or any of these things to appear young. And so I think from a very early age, I got the understanding that sexiness, and I know that's a trigger word for a lot of Muslims, and I know people are gonna say, oh, I stuck for the light, you shouldn't be talking about sexiness. But when it, when it comes to a woman wanting to feel desirable to her partner, to her husband, this is a very real concern. But what I saw in these women who were older, this was not really an issue. They were fully comfortable in who they were. So that was my first understanding about sexual desire across the lifespan and what it means for women as we go through different cycles of life. So let's let's talk about it. When I when I teach my rites of passage class for women, foundational womanhood, and when I teach my my course Art of Seduction, we talk about the four stages that a woman passes through. So you have the fledgling. This is a woman who has uh, she's a she's prepubescent. She hasn't yet started her menses, but she's learning. She's learning from her sister. She's learning from her mother. She's learning from the women who are modeling femininity and womanhood around her. There may be curiosity about the different shapes that a woman's body can have because she's still, although she may be getting taller, she still has the body of a child. Then you move into the phase of a nurturer. Uh, the nurturer, this phase, and these are all phases that I came up with myself, <laughs> so you can write them down. It starts with the fledging. So that will be birth to right before the onset of menses. So for my daughter, for example, that will be birth to age 12. I have a, a nine-year-old daughter who's still in that fledgling stage. They're absorbing, they're learning, they are building the internal script that will dictate their sexual lives in the future. Then you have the nurturer, that is from the onset of menstruation until prior to the onset of menopause. The nurturer phase for some women, depending on your life expectancy, uh, can be the longest period that you live. Uh, it is a period that is marked by pregnancy if a woman chooses to give birth. Uh, it can be marked by um, uh, issues with fertility for women who have challenges with fertility. Uh, it is marked by a lot of labor. The nurturer phase is when a woman takes on various roles. She becomes a person of utility in her family and in her community. She is mother, she is auntie, she is teacher, she is sister, she is worker, she is builder, she's Sunday school teacher, she's Quran teacher. Everything is about output. What can you do? And while she is nurturing people physically, there may be a depletion mentally. So many women in this phase suffer from uh, emotional, spiritual, and often physical 
burnout because of the mental load that we have to have. Again, this is not just for women who are married. This is not just for women who have children, because a lot of times when we have these conversations about sexuality and desire and, and women's life cycles, we always put motherhood in there. Motherhood was not written for everyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make right for it that every woman has to have a child and will have a child. There are women who definitely have um, serious issues around fertility that they have to deal with from a physical standpoint and also a mental standpoint. And all of this uh, becomes a form of fatigue. Then, uh, during this stage, you also have the ending of puberty. We often think that puberty ends when they graduate from high school. That's what I used to think. Before I, I really started studying this, I thought puberty ended uh, at the end of high school. Uh, when I turned 18, I was done with puberty. Even though I was confused, I was crying all the time, I was an emotional wreck, my body was still going through changes, and it wasn't until later that I learned that puberty actually doesn't end until you're about 24, 25 years old. So all through university, this explains why I had so many problems <laughs> with understanding where I was in my life because I was still, my body was still growing. My brain was still developing. So during that nurturer phase, lots and lots of things are happening internally and socially that can affect a woman's approach to her body and approach to desire. Then you have the onset of menopause. Uh, I am going to be the first woman in my immediate family to go through menopause because as an African-American woman, uh, my community, many women in my community, uh, my sisters and mother included, had hysterectomies very early due to a number of reproductive health concerns. Uh, we, don't have a, 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 we don't have enough time to talk about the history of slavery and colonialism uh, and systemic uh, racism and institutionalized oppression that has affected the reproductive health of black women in colonized spaces, America being one of them. Uh, but my mother and my sisters both had different forms of reproductive cancers, uh, reproductive system cancers that meant that they had to have hysterectomies in order to save their lives. So they never experienced menopause. They don't know what menopause is. And the majority of people that I hear talking about menopause uh, are women who are much older, in their 60s. Uh, they're often white women, often women you know, with big uh, 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 mansions, and they're, they're on television talking about having hot flashes. So menopause seems like this very strange thing that only happens to old people. Uh, but during that menopausal phase, that's that third phase of womanhood, and I call that the discoverer phase. It is discovering a new way to live. You get a whole new body. It may not be the body that you expected. It's not the body that society thinks that you should like or that you should have. But the discoverer phase is a very special phase. Out of the four phases of womanhood, you have fledgling, you have nurturer, then you have discoverer. Discoverer is my favorite because as you noted, it's the most misunderstood, the one that we don't talk about enough. So the discoverer phase starts at the onset of menopause. What is menopause? Menopause is highly irregular or the complete absence of menstruation. A lot of people think that your period has to stop completely in order for you to have entered menopause, and that's not true. Uh, if your cycle was normally every 28 days, lasting for four days, and then you go 67 days, and then you have a period for two days, and then you go 72 days, and you have a period for five days, and then you go 104 days, and you have a period for seven days, you are entering into that phase known as perimenopause before menopause starts. Uh, if you have questions about that, I am not a medical doctor. You can seek out uh, information from your reproductive health uh, doctor or reproductive health specialist. But menopause, I like to call it a second puberty. Think about what you what you went through when you first went to puberty, right? Uh, skin changes, might have ha started having acne. Uh, your body would start to grow. For girls, you start to grow breasts. Uh, that nubile phase with, with new breasts that are forming, they can be very painful and sore. Uh, you get cramps for the first time if you experience cramps. Uh, you may have difficulty sleeping because of discomfort you know, with your menstrual cycle. Mood swings and mood changes because of the different levels of hormones in your body. Uh, you may start to experience changes uh, in your hair. Uh, so your hair might start to feel a little bit different. All of that comes back in menopause. All of it 
comes back in menopause. And you would think, since this is the second time that our body is experiencing this, that we would be used to it by then. But it doesn't quite work like that. So menopause, the, the onset of menopause generally comes between ages 45 and 55. I always tell women, look at the history of women in your family. You generally follow that pattern. For example, I started my period at the age of 12. My daughter started her period at the age of 12. My youngest daughter is nine. She's probably going to start her period around the same time. So if your mother didn't go into menopause until 57, and it's out of that 10-year range, 45 to 55, that the, the Journal of American Medical Association has, has um, dictated, uh, it doesn't mean that it, there's anything wrong, right? So between 45 and 55. And menopause itself can last five to seven years, but, but as long as 14 years. And during this time of menopause, uh, you experience some of the same things that you might have experienced uh, during puberty. Uh, you experience um, changes in the skin. So the skin, uh, instead of having uh, the cystic acne that I had in my youth, right, I might to de develop uh, eczema. I might develop breakouts. They call it adult acne. Those are your hormones reacting in the body, right? Also your diet and lifestyle have things to do with it as well. But you also may experience a loss of skin elasticity. It's what causes wrinkles, people, okay? It's why, you know, people have wrinkles. Kim Kardashian, she is definitely not a model uh, for me in any way, shape, or form, but she is a cultural model for a lot of people. She recently said that she would do anything to keep looking young, even if it meant eating uh, human waste. She would she would do anything. I think it, I think that's what she said. I'm paraphrasing, but she said she would do anything so that she could appear youthful, uh, and that's that push against the natural process of aging. Menopause is completely natural. You can't stop it. Uh, you can't prevent it, uh, but you can ease into it with information. So, and you may not have all of these symptoms, right? So you have the the, the thinning of the the skin on the face. You also have the thinning of the skin down below. The, the, the skin of the vulva can start to thin as well. And you can start to experience, um, in some extreme cases, muscle atrophy. So the, the vaginal muscles may not uh, be as strong as they were before if you're not exercising and using them regularly. Vaginal dryness is also a thing uh, that can, can occur. Osteoporosis, so uh, bone fragility, um, changes in bone density, uh, night sweats, waking up at night and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, it's December, uh, who turned the heat on? Um, hot flashes during the day where you have these extreme temperatures in the body and also PMS-like symptoms. Now, I don't like that, that phrasing, uh, but I use it because people will know what I mean when I say PMS-like symptoms, but moodiness. And that moodiness is coming from the intense changes. It's like your body is, is making itself over anew. It is finishing out this period of utility for a certain period of your life and shifting into something else. So in addition to the mood swings that you may have, you may also experience headaches. All of that when it comes together can lead to a decrease in sexual desire. So let's talk about sexual desire. There are some questions. I don't know if I'm supposed to answer these at the same time. No, no, uh, someone says if puberty ends at 25, what does that mean for marriage is done prior to that on the health of the woman? Nothing. Uh, having sex before the age of 25, before you have completed puberty, does not mean that you shouldn't be having sex before the age of 25. What it means is being, being careful and gracious with yourself and understanding that your body is changing. It's understanding that the, the uh, not lamenting at 25, right, or 26 or 27, when you look in the mirror and your body starts to resemble your mother or your auntie because now you have hips where you didn't have hips before, you have backside where you didn't have backside before, uh, your breasts start to take on a different shape or a different fullness. This is just letting you know you should be gracious with yourself because this is your, what your body is naturally designed to do. If you get married at 16, get married at 17, that's totally fine. Just don't expect to have the same body at 26 that you had at 17. That's why I'm, I'm talking about that. And also note the mental changes. What advice do you have for women? Okay, so we'll, 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 we'll get to the, the, the marrying and, and, and younger men, younger women part in a bit. So menopause is often seen as a, a phase of life where women, and even doctors say this, there's a decreased sexual desire. Uh, I'm just gonna say, 
I don't think that that's all necessarily true for everyone. Uh, some women may experience decreased sexual desire. However, I think we have a misunderstanding of what desire is. So let's talk about desire versus arousal. Uh, Naima, should I answer the question now or should we save that question about marrying younger women until the end? Oh no, we can do questions at the end. Okay, so when I was younger, uh, my mother is 30 years older than me, almost exactly 30 years older than me. It's interesting because my, my mother's almost exactly 30 years older than me. I'm almost, I'm almost exactly 30 years older than my son. Uh, my mother would tell me when I was a teenager, let me preface this by saying, um, I'm going to say this as nicely as I can. Don't come for my mom in the comments. That's the best way I can say it. That's the nicest way I can say it, okay? My mother is not a Muslim. My mother is a clinical psychologist. This may harm the sensitivities of some Muslims. But my mother would tell me when I was a teenager, you haven't seen anything yet. Wait until you get older. Everything is better when you're older, including sex. I kept that in my mind because my mother said this with a level of knowledge that let me know that she knew something and I didn't. I was not having sex as a teenager. I didn't know anything, but that stuck in my mind. She said sex and everything gets, old, get, gets better when you're older. And she would talk to me about how a woman's sex drive actually increases when you get older. We hear these, you know, cultural stereotypes about how, you know, men reach their sexual peak at 25, women reach their sexual peak at 40. I call bollocks on all of that, right? Uh, I think it is. it has a lot to do with understanding the difference between arousal and desire. So desire is the mental capacity or need for more, for pleasure, right? A desire. I desire a bowl of chocolate ice cream, right? Uh, it, is, it is a mental need, right? It's an intense need. Arousal is the physical manifestation of that desire. So you have desire, mental, arousal is physical. What are signs of arousal? Some signs of arousal might be uh, nipples that become erect for both men and, and women, right? Uh, a penis that becomes erect, a vagina that is lubricated. Uh, these are signs of arousal. A clitoris uh, becoming engorged with, with blood, right? These are signs of arousal. But there's something that we never talk about, which is arousal non-concordance. And for me, as I work with women who are aging, as I myself go through the process of aging, I'm starting to understand that we don't understand arousal, desire, and something called arousal non-concordance, which can help us to understand cycles of desire. So we're gonna go back to the nurture phase for a bit. Picture this, a mom, she has two children, uh, 13 and, and nine, and she has a toddler who's two. She is working outside of the home uh, as a teacher at her children's school. Her husband works. They have a very loving relationship. He pays all of the bills. Uh, she uses her money to take care of things for the kids and saves for family vacations. Her two-year-old is in daycare. Uh, she cooks you know, meals from scratch every night. Uh, she spends time with her kids on the weekend going through their Islamic school lessons. Uh, she herself wants to go back to school for a PhD in Islamic studies in an online program. Uh, from the outside looking, and she has a very good life, right? She loves her husband. Her husband still thinks she's sexy and desirable. Uh, and, and she really has it together. Her house is clean. The kids are clean. The food is good. Everything is good. But at night, when she lies down, and her husband wants to come to her to engage in marital relations. She has, she still thinks her husband is, is fantastic. He's still the most beautiful man that she's ever met. He's the only man that she's ever been with, but her body is not lubricated when he touches her. They used to be able to have amazing marital relations, but now it's very difficult for her to get lubricated. It's very difficult for her to experience any signs of physical arousal in her mind, although she really desires her husband. This is an example of something called arousal non-concordance. What arousal non-concordance says is there are two types of arousal that affect arousal non-concordance. One is subjective arousal. Subjective arousal is in my mind, I want this thing. In my mind, I want my husband, right? This is what the woman is saying. In my mind, I love my husband. I desire my husband. I really want to be with my husband. But the physical arousal, the signs are not there. The body is like, 
you think you want this and you're saying that you want this, but we're not complying. That's non-concordance, arousal non-concordance. That happens a lot in women who are in the nurturer phase, who are in the active process of uh, caretaking, whether that is for children, whether that is for elderly parents, whether that is a person who is in, in, in school or is going through a HIVS program. You know, stress doesn't just have to be, you know, this monumental thing. It's whatever causes your body an inability to process the, the external stimulation that you have. That external stimulation can affect your desire, right? The desire that you know that you have, and it can make your body unresponsive. Now, is this a bad thing? No, it's a misunderstood thing. And this is what happens a lot with women who are in that menopausal phase, women who are mothers, women who are experiencing menopause, women who are stressed, women who are grieving. We are still in the throes of, of an ever evolving pandemic. We've come out of COVID-19, now we're going into monkeypox. Right, mental health is at a, a, a is at an all time low. Uh, we're grieving loss of of people and community and opportunities. All of this is having a weight on us. So, as a woman who is cycling through through various stages of life, it can feel as if my body is broken. And I've had sisters say, "Auntie, my, I, you know, I, I, my husband, uh, I, he, I just, I just, it's just not working for us anymore. I really desire him." but I don't really wanna have sex. And I, the first thing that I ask is, what did you eat today? When was the last time you had water? When was the last time you took a nap? When was the last time you just did absolutely nothing? Because stress has a huge effect on cycles of desire and cycles that a woman may go through. Uh, so when your body is going through all of these changes, it will absolutely affect your proclivity for sexual activity. When you add menopause on top of that and the social and cultural pressures that aging women have, it can exacerbate the, the, the problem. Uh, I hate, that's not a good word. I shouldn't say hate. I really strongly dislike the phrase aging gracefully. What does that mean to age gracefully? Aging is something that is guaranteed to each and every one of us. We've all aged 29 minutes since I first started talking, <laughs> whether we want it to or not. Time is just gonna keep moving. We are aging. Aging means that you are what? You are living. Because if you're not aging, you're dead. You, you don't exist anymore, right? You're not living. So aging gracefully, what does it mean to age gracefully? You just age. It's a neutral, it's a neutral point of fact for any person who is living. But there's this pressure on women to age gracefully, to get Botox. Now, I get Botox for migraines. I only get a little bit of Botox to manage my migraines. I have wrinkles. I have aging skin. Um, parts of my body that looked different 10 years ago um, are, you know, slowly morphing into something different now. And it's okay. But the messaging that we get, even in spaces that are intended for women who are older, look at any uh, um, uh, advertisement for gray hair shampoo. So there's a shampoo called Shimmer Lights by Clairol. It's purple shampoo for women who have blonde hair or who have graying hair. And I was telling my sister-in-law's mother about this shampoo. And when I looked at the ads, every woman on the ad looked like a 25-year-old woman with gray hair. But these were supposed to be women who were menopausal, women who were aging, women who were in their 40s and their 50s. But the cultural messaging is that, sure, you can have gray hair, but you're supposed to look like you're 25. You have women who have absorbed these messages unconsciously, even Muslim women. Even Muslim women who do not consume media, it is evident even within our own communities because what you have is and this is gonna rub some people the wrong way, but I've seen it happen so often in this work. You have men in their late 40s, in their early 50s, late 50s, abandoning relationships, abandoning marriages that they've had for 25 years, for 15 years, for 30 years, and they're swapping out their wife for a younger model. Now, I don't know what happens in everybody's relationship, but when I see that start to crop up, when I see that start to be suggested by brothers with podcasts, by brothers with platforms, by imams in the community, when couples come to them, I've had a couple come to me and say, you know, we've had these issues in our marriage and the imam suggested that my husband get a younger wife. What does that do to the psyche of a woman? When you feel as if you are no longer useful because you're not useful anymore. 
Why is it that the older a man gets, the sexier he gets, but the older a woman gets, the more matronly and motherlike she gets? This is a part of the cultural conditioning and programming that happens even in religious spaces that really pushes against really the sunnah of our community. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his marriage to Khadija, may Allah be well pleased with her, is an example of what we should be striving for, an older woman who is still seen as being a beautiful woman, a useful woman, a faithful woman, a woman who is worthy of this uh, divine companionship. Yet that doesn't really play out in our communities because of the ways that we allow our obsession with youth to taint our focus on relationships. And, and that that's a problem for a lot of women. So if you're a woman and you're in your late 40s, you're in your mid 40s, you're in your early 50s, and you you know, are at a, a sister's uh, conference, right, in person, and people are calling you auntie, uh, and you've dyed your hair with henna, so it's bright red when you take your hijab off, and people start to look at you a different way, you start to feel a certain way, that gets into your psyche. When you go home at night to your husband, that can affect your desire. And I'm, I'm saying all of this because I think we don't think deeply enough about the nuanced ways that we are taught to hate our bodies, the ways that women are taught to hate the aging process when it's really something that we should be embracing. Because to be alive is an opportunity, another opportunity to worship Allah, another opportunity to seek Tawbah, another opportunity to experience whatever good there is in this dunya. But we don't talk about how that affects our bodies. We also don't talk about, and I know this conversation is about women, but we also don't talk about how aging affects men because men are seen as being um, virile up to a certain point. <laughs> it's like up to a certain point, like he's good to go, right? Once he starts to hit like mid fifties, women start looking at brothers a little bit differently and that can cause performance anxiety in men. I have couples that I've worked with. I have men in my family who've said, you know, uh, Angie, I don't, I, and by the way, don't call me Angie. Only people in my family can call me that. They say, you know, Angie, um, I really want to get married again, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my, my late fifties. You know, women aren't really checking for me. That causes performing anxiety in the men. So what that, what happens is, uh, your husband, you're, you're 46, your husband is 52. You're dealing with all of this messaging. You're dealing with the hormonal changes in your body. Stuff is just not working the way that it used to. He's, you know, on the basketball court playing basketball with the young brothers and his knees are hurting in ways that they didn't hurt before. And he's starting to feel, he's starting to feel his age. And then you all come together at night. You come together at night and you both have arousal non-concordance because you have this stress. You both desire each other, you love each other a lot, but you have all of these competing factors. You have changing hormonal levels, you have changing environmental um, antecedents that are affecting you coming together. So then when he's not able to become erect, you start to feel, oh, he doesn't really love me, he doesn't really desire me, he doesn't really want me. And when you don't respond to his touch and your body doesn't feel the way that it used to when he used to touch you, he starts to feel, maybe I really don't have it. So it just becomes compounding. So how can we stop this? Uh, one of the ways that we deal with this, right, the changes that our bodies go through, understanding the changes, welcoming the changes is exactly what we're doing right now. We're having a conversation uh, about intimacy. Intimacy is so much more than the physical. I have something called the intimacy pyramid. So we talk about spiritual, intellectual, experiential, emotional and physical intimacy, right? So intimacy, authentic intimacy, really encompasses all of these things, but we don't talk about the physical enough, which is why it's important that we're having um, this conversation. Uh, it's also important for us to not be afraid to broach the subject of menopause, uh, to broach the subject of how does your body change during motherhood? How, you know, is, is it normal for my urethra to shift positions after I have children? This is a conversation that we can be having with our girlfriends, uh, with our mothers, with our aunties, with people like me, but we're afraid to have that conversation. We're afraid to talk about the changes in our body. We're afraid to ask, well, what do you do? If, do you, have you ever tried a lubricant? You know, we don't even, Muslims sometimes, we don't even wanna have this conversation about these things because we think, oh, haram, haram, haram. 
but lubricant might be something that might be very important for a woman who is experience, experiencing vaginal dryness during perimenopause and menopause. And there are lots of good alternatives out there, but we have uh, women who are suffering in silence and we have Muslim couples that are suffering uh, in silence because of the fear and the shame around not knowing, uh, around um, feeling as if they are inadequate somehow. So I'm really happy um, that we're having this conversation. So I just said a whole bunch so I'm going to stop right now <laughs> and see uh, where we are. What questions you might have. <laughs> Sis, you said all the things, mashallah. I was just watching this with a friend of mine and I was saying, how did she have this whole conversation with apparently no notes and just, <laughs> just, you know, just, just going with it, subhanAllah. So I, I think that you've, Jazakallah khair, I think you've touched on some, firstly, very thought provoking points, but also some really important information that most of us don't have about the aging process about you know potentially how it affects us uh, and may affect us and what we can do about that so we do have some questions mashallah guys please do put your questions in the chat those of you who are watching live on youtube put your questions in we're going to check them out and those of you in the vip room please put your questions in i wanted to know a little bit more about the um, arousal non-concordance right uh, that you mentioned is my first time hearing that phrase um, what are the causes and also what is the solution? So if mentally you would, you, you have the desire, but physically you're not manifesting the symptoms, the, the arousal, what, what, what do you do about that? A lot of times it can be episodic. So it's not something that will, is perpetual. I would, I would only say seek out a doctor's input if it's something that happens all of the time, because there could be some other issue that's going on. Um, but a lot of times it's it's being kind to yourself and just recognizing that this this just may not be the time and this may not be the the space. You just may not be in the mood. We talk about being in the mood a lot. Um, and we often talk about women not being in the mood. Men can also not be in the mood, but it's just being patient with yourself. Uh, what are the causes? The causes can be a variety of things. It could be diet. It could be lack of sleep. It could be stress. Uh, there could be some other physical concerns, which is, you know, if this is something that's ongoing a lot, you might want to see a doctor, particularly if you're a man experiencing arousal non-concordance and you're not able to get an erection. Lots of men with diabetes have problems with, um, you know, erectile dysfunction. But when I, I'll be transparent, when I have experienced arousal non-concordance, it's during times when I'm completely overwhelmed and burned out. It's like, this is, I have so many things to do. Sex is not on my to-do list today. I, I don't need to do it. That's, that's, that's not something I want to do today, right? And, and, and I think being honest about it and, and experiencing other parts of intimacy. So arousal non-concordance doesn't mean that no physical intimacy can happen. What it means is that there might need to be different types of stimulation. Okay. It might need a longer foreplay session. Okay. It might need just cuddling and just hugging. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is something that you can do for your partner to relieve the, the sexual tension that they have and you might not be engaging in it. But it's understanding that it's, it's perfectly normal. Emily Nagoski talks about arousal non-concordance in her book, Come As You Are. And I saw um, Ustaz Ifet. She's, she's one of my favorite people. She's one of my students. Um, she does amazing work. And I know she has often recommended that book. So I don't know if she recommended that book, but I highly recommend Come As You Are. And Emily Nagoski talks about arousal non-concordance and the fact that 90%, 90% of cisgender, that means women who were born with a vagina and still identify as a woman, because um, you have to be very clear in 2022 about who you're talking about, 90% of women experience arousal non-concordance. So it's not uncommon at all. Sometimes. And, it, and it, 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 it's something that will happen from time to time and it does not have to be perpetual. Okay, all right. So that's a, I get a relief, I think, probably yes. for, for, for <laughs> many people out there, mashallah, especially the scenario that you've painted, you know, that picture of this busy mom, you know, we, we all know that, that that whole, you know, what was did you call it, the nurturer phase? Yes. Especially with young children, pregnancies, breastfeeding, et cetera, it can be, it can be really, uh, really, heavy uh, in terms of you know brain and what's going on up there subhanallah so jazakallah khairan for that i want to just turn quickly to this question here which i think is an interesting one because the sister says what advice do you have for women who marry late 
right, in their 30s or 40s, so they're virgins, right, up until their 30s or 40s, so they'd be losing their virginity at that stage. Mm -hmm. Is there anything they should be aware of physically? Or even a man who's marrying a woman at that stage who is a virgin in her 30s or 40s, is there anything physically that they should be aware of? Uh, she should be aware of her reproductive health history. So, you know, when did she start her uh, menses? When did her mother start her menses? When did her mother start menopause? Um, knowing that you're late 30s, you're not really close to menopause. It seems like you're close to menopause, but you're not really close to menopause at all. And even in your 40s, I went to my doctor last year. I'll be 47 in a couple of months, mashallah. Um, and she said, Angelica, you're not close to menopause. Like, why do you think that? You're, no, you won't go through it. And she could tell by, you know, by base, based on looking every, at everything. So one is being kind to yourself and acknowledging the fact that uh, menopause is not something that's like knocking right at the door, but also understanding that as a woman ages, as a man ages, our bodies change. So educating yourself as much as possible about uh, fertility in later life. Uh, all of my pregnancies were considered geriatric pregnancies because I had all of my children in my 30s and all of them were healthy, um, completely complication-free pregnancies. Uh, if you are a woman who is losing her virginity in her 30s or 40s, uh, there may be some issues sometimes with a mental shift that has to happen. So if you were born and raised Muslim or if you're a convert to Islam, you're, in your, you're, you're 39, right? You, say you converted to Islam at the age of 21, for 18 years you have been, you've been hearing the messaging that sex belongs inside of marriage. Do not sit with a non-mahram man. Um, do not look at these images. It can create a mental block in your head such that when you do get married, some women, not all, please understand when I say this, not all women, but some women may develop vaginismus when they are having sex for the first time at any age, right? At any age. So this is not just for women who are in their 30s and their 40s. So it's important to understand uh, what vaginismus is and, and things that might come up and things that you can do to help um, to alleviate those symptoms. But there's really nothing that I think the woman or the, the spouse, the man has to do except for um, stay informed. I have friends who were married for the first time at 41, and they have a perfectly, from what they report, a perfectly healthy, perfectly happy sex life. So it's not as though um, the sex cannot be good. It's the same thing that would be required for, for any woman. And knowing that, um, the only consideration would be if you want to be a woman who is carrying a baby in her 40s, there may be certain things that you want to consider health-wise, even outside of reproductive health, even just in terms of emotional capacity, right? Do you want to do you want to have a child at 43? You know, do you want to have a baby at that age? It may be, it might be perfectly fine, but that would be the only consideration that I would really strongly think about. Yeah, um, you know, you mentioned about vaginismus, and you know, I've got a great conversation with Amir Razaki. You guys have probably seen it on the channel. Really deep dive into that condition. And it is a lot more common than people think. It's not, it's not, you know, that common, but it's more common than people think, right? And something that came up in the comments that I wonder if you can speak to was, what does a man do? Or what should a man know? Because obviously men don't know anything, especially brothers. Like, they don't know about stuff like that, okay? They may know a thing or two, but they don't know stuff like that. So mm -hmm. if a man finds himself, you know, he's, he's going to get married, inshallah, firstly, Okay, my questions are, is there anything that we need to talk about beforehand to mm -hmm. see if this is an eventuality? And if, la qadr Allah, you do get into that situation, and guys, for those of you who don't know, what that will look like is that penetration is not possible. Yes, sister, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. So I, somebody... It's, not, it's either not possible or extremely painful. Extremely painful, right? Extremely. So there is an, a cultural idea that losing your virginity is painful anyway, right? So a man may not necessarily see that as a bad thing if you know his wife is cringing as this is happening, um, mm -hmm. and and you know there were comments where a man said like you know you, you you're not going to refuse your husband on the first night like what is this? So <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know, right? Roll eyes, but again, again ignorance, right? Mm -hmm not even knowing that this is a thing. So how, what could you say to the brothers, fathers, mothers as well, for mm -hmm. how to prepare their sons for mm -hmm. their wedding night? Because we're always talking about preparing the girls for their wedding night. How can mm -hmm. we prepare our sons for their wedding night? The first thing to say, 
is that sex on your wedding night is not obligatory. It's not a requirement. There's no religious stipulation that says you have to have sex on your wedding night or your wedding is, your marriage is null and void. And I say this to women, I say this to men, because there's an immense amount of pressure to perform. You have lived your entire life possibly with never having any form of sexual stimulation and you're expected to have knock down, drag out, swing from the chandelier sex on your wedding night. That is not an obligation. Now, I'm not saying to refuse and say, oh my gosh, I would never touch you. I don't want to be near you. That's a whole different conversation. But relieving the pressure for the wedding night means talking to your son and saying, this is your first time being with this woman. You have to take it easy. You have to take it slow. You have to be patient for both of you. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. I always tell couples the best sex of your life should not be on your wedding night because if it is, everything else is downhill from there. Instead, focus on being patient and focus on being kind. Uh, men who have wives who have a difficulty penetrating their wives, their wives uh, may be experiencing um, vaginismus. One of the things that I highly, highly recommend is learning the technique kunyaza. Habiba Kande has a book about it. I teach classes about it. I have a couples class on kunyaza coming up very soon. Uh, and kunyaza is a non-penetrative form of stimulation. Now, Kunyaza only works if the woman consents to participating in kunyaza. There's no penetration involved, but there is skin-to-skin -skin contact of, of the, the, the penis and the vagina and the vulva. So it is important to make sure that she's comfortable with it. But the reason why I like kunyaza is because, one, there's no penetration involved. Two, uh, it requires a lot of patience and a lot of willpower on behalf of the man. So what it does is it helps men who are newlyweds learn how to uh, keep their erection longer. And it is an intense act of close physical intimacy. Uh, women, one of the one of the, the tools that women use to to help to cure themselves of, of vaginismus and that doctors might you know recommend for them to use are dilators with, that are inserted into the the vaginal cavity. But with kunyaza, there's no insertion, but there is relaxation. There is stimulation of the clitoris. There is stimulation of the labia, and there is that skin to skin contact. And if there's lubrication that's happening, there can be an intense pleasure for the man as well. But brothers need to understand first what vaginismus is because I've I've had a sister say that her husband felt very proud that it was difficult for him to penetrate her because he thought that it was because of his size men have to understand that vaginismus is not because you're so big you can't fit uh, vaginismus is not your wife doesn't love you vaginismus is not she's afraid of sex vaginismus has um, lots of physical and also psychological um, sources so understanding what vaginismus is just like women have to be educated about their bodies if men are having sex with women they also have to be educated as well so i, I think using um, in addition to kunyaza other forms of physical intimacy that are not penetrative are also extremely important especially on the wedding night focus on kissing focus on touching focus on being close together stop putting so much pressure because one thing that we never talk about is we never talk about how a lot of men have performance anxiety on their wedding night and it is not uncommon for men to not be able to get an erection because there is this extreme fear so these are you know vaginismus and erectile dysfunction these are you know extreme cases but this is what we have to talk about what we have to learn about uh we spend a lot of time preparing for the marriage ceremony but we don't spend a lot of time preparing for the sex life within marriage and that that should change guys you all heard that word and that is a whole word right there we don't prepare enough now um i want us to close out with this question because i know that you're going to have a field day with this inshallah uh -oh. asks in the youtube how do we talk about sexual desires and marriage with our mothers or sisters when it's seen as shameful um you know i'm not a good person to Asked this question because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me with a mother who is a clinical psychologist and who also was very, very open with all of her daughters, such that I'd be like, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> um, but I'll say this. The older that I've gotten, I would have had a different answer in my 20s. The older that I've gotten, I will say, let them guide the conversation. Do not push them into spaces that they don't want to go. 
you almost have to treat our elders like we treat teenagers. Don't push too hard because you'll push them away. Understand that these are women who have lived their entire lives. Uh, they may have birthed you. They may have birthed your parents. So obviously they know something about sex, but you have to think about what protective factors come with that shame. Do they not talk about sex because it was something to protect them within their you know, spaces so that they would not be abused? Uh, I have a, a, one of my students whose who's, uh, mother lived through partition. And she said one of the things that, that, that led to a lot of the, the shaming around sex wasn't really shame, it was protection. You had to protect the young girls in the family. So there were certain things that you just didn't talk about. You didn't talk about having a period because that might show that you were someone who was you know sexually ripe or sexually ready. Um, but I think easing into the conversation by asking questions helps to open the door. So if you go to your mother or your grandmother or your aunt and you're asking for advice and you ask for advice in a way that might push the boundary a little bit that can open the door. So you might say, you know, I really, I'm really having difficulty after having the baby. It, it seems really hard for me to want to have relations with my husband. What advice could you give me, right? And and they may not give you the best answer the first time, but when you start to to lead into this type of questioning, it leads to a feeling of safety and security. They can feel as though, okay, you're not trying to set me up to you know berate me. You really are asking, and then that opens the space to have conversations. We have to understand that if if this is 2022, and some of us are just getting this information, what about people who were you know in their 20 somethings in in, in in the, the the 60s the 70s the 50s right we have a lot of mashallah elders in our community so we have to be very kind and understand that um, these conversations can be had respectfully but it's not something that's going to happen overnight it has to happen incrementally with a high level of deference and respect for their sensitivities because we also don't know what traumas our elders uh, may hold mashallah I love that answer. Jazakallah khairan, sis. That's, yeah, that's, that's that real food for thought, I think, for all of us. So I've got a couple of questions here, mashallah. Um, this, I love this one. So one of our VIPs <laughs> has been listening intently and <laughs> says that it seems that for an older couple to still enjoy their sex life, the woman should be made to feel as relaxed as possible. Is that correct? Both people should feel relaxed. Why are you going into sex angry? Don't be stressed out and angry. Sex is supposed to be fun. Mm. It's not just procreation. I think, yes, everyone should be relaxed. But if it's an older couple, um, I don't know, should I say that? I'll, I'll say it, because whatever, because people are already going to come for me because I said the sex is not mandatory on the wedding night, so we're just going to let it roll. Listen, the older you get, the older couples that I deal with in private practice, those people are doing the wildest stuff. They are having the most fun. They love it. 40s, 50s. There is a level of bodily autonomy and self-confidence that comes with age that you simply don't have when you're in your 20s. I'm sorry. It, it just, it develops over time. So yes, the woman should be relaxed, but the man should be relaxed too. And, and sex should be fun. Sex doesn't have to just be for procreation. It can absolutely be for pleasure. All of it, it works together. Um, and it's not just, you know, tiptoeing to your wife and, and like you're, you know, walking on eggshells. But we have to stop looking at sex as just being something to bring children in the world or something that is a religious duty and responsibility to our spouses. We also can and should look at sex as a way to release pressure, as a way to relax you. Sex can be relaxing. You can go into sex feeling stressed out and with the right touch, the right move, the right positioning, the right what have you, you can absolutely become relaxed. And there's nothing wrong with that spiritually, ethically, mentally, physically, or socially. It's actually a good thing. Jazakallah khairan. Oh, this is so good. This is so good. And it kind of bounces off what our previous uh, sister Ifet was saying, mashallah, because uh, she touched on this aspect as well, mashallah. Um, okay, guys, so you heard the tea, okay? It gets better as you get older. So lots to look forward to, inshallah. Yes, Finally, Allah. I've got a question here. It's not really a question. It's a comment that somebody made. And I think that they were um, sort of laughing in a wry way. But they said that my wife was on her period on our wedding night. And I'd like us to talk a little bit about intimacy during menstruation. Can we touch on that? Is that too sure. close to the bone? No, 
Oh, it's listen, I'm used to being skewered by now, but <laughs> this one is easy, actually. This is very easy because you can look at a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What did he do with his wives when they were on their menstrual cycle? What did he instruct them to do? What did he tell them to wear? To wear a cloth around their waist and he would put his head in their lap while they were menstruating. He would kiss them. He would fondle their breasts. This is not what I'm saying. These are in hadith. I have a student who was doing an Alamiya program and she sent me this message. She was like, auntie, read this hadith and she sent it to me in Arabic. I said, I don't know what that means. And she translated it. I said, I still don't know what it means. And she told me what it meant in English. And it was talking about the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kissed his wives and how he kissed his wives. The, 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 the sunnah is very descriptive in terms of the ways in which Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was with his wives. It's not graphic but it's very specific and it should be a model for us and how we can engage in physical intimacy, even during those times when you cannot have penetrative sex. So if your wife is on your period on her wedding day, why can you all not slow dance? Why can't you all give each other a massage? Um, there's a type of massage that's done body to body where the, you're, you're not clothed at all. Um, there's lots of different pleasure points in the soles of the feet. Men's feet actually are more sensitive than women's feet. Um, there are different parts of your body that you can explore, that you can touch. There are lots of different ways to be intimate without having penetrative sex. And when people say that I can't have sex on my period, it's haram. This is true. The penis cannot be inserted into the vagina when a woman is on her cycle. That does not mean that you cannot experience physical intimacy. And this is where education comes. It's very important. It's it's also very important to explore with your partner. You can have a, a whole game that you play. Say, we are going to do as many things as we can to stimulate each other, but we are not going to have sex. And that can be a starting off point to know what are the more sensitive erogenous zones on your partner's body. Some people's erogenous zones are more sensitive than, than others. You can look up erogenous zones before your wedding days. This is something that you also have to plan for with your son. You have to let your son know, listen, your wife might have her period on your wedding night, which means she might have it for three or four days after the, the, the wedding. You also have to be prepared for that. I think that um, talking about physical intimacy has to extend beyond penetrative sex. And that is really where the fun and the true pleasure lies when you are um, able to experience pleasure with the fullness of your entire body, not just your genitalia. And I think that is a fitting close to a very informative session. You know, I'm just like grinning under here because I always am, mashallah, um, whenever we get a chance to speak. And I love the emphasis uh, that we've had really from both of our speakers this evening on gaining knowledge, getting the right frame of understanding around this topic and exploration, pleasure and play you know, uh, which we tend to be a bit afraid of associating with, with intimacy, but really, you know, this is one of the, one of the fruits of it, I guess, um, and one of the, the best parts of it. So sis, please tell the viewers where they can find you and how they can learn more from you, inshallah. Sure. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook at Village Auntie. That's Auntie with I-E at the end. Um, I also have the Village Auntie Institute. Uh, you can follow TVA Institute uh, on Instagram. I do workshops. I do classes. I'm opening up once again for private clients, uh, both uh, single women. I don't do single brothers uh, and couples. And I have a program that is starting on September 17th called Foundational Womanhood. It's a 12-week rites of passage program for women. It's an intergenerational, international, intercultural, interfaith rites of passage uh, womanhood training program for women. But everything uh, that you find about any of my class offerings, you can find uh, on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. And soon to be, my website is almost finished, villageauntie.com. We love to see it. Thank you so much, sis. Jazakallah kullu khair for taking the time out of your schedule. Please tell the babies we said Jazakallah khair and we love them. <laughs> tell the mister that we appreciate him. Tell him to look after you. You look after him. Look after those babies. And may Allah bless you in all your affairs. Fi dunya wa fi akhira. Love you for the sake of Allah. And you know this is not the last time, inshallah. <laughs> no, it's not. not inshallah. Jazakallah khair, sis. Thank you so much. <laughs> Guys, that is it. That is it. We are out for tonight. Make sure that you follow the Village Auntie, inshallah, on her channels. 
um, and, and you know dive into any of the resources that you find that are useful to you. Uh, those of you who are on YouTube right now, make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you share the link to the video so that more people can watch. This is our first live stream of the weekend. It is not our last. We will have more live streams tomorrow night when we've got a host of amazing speakers coming through. We've got Sister Hale Banani. We've got Brother Gabriel Romani. We've got, who else have we got? Nisa Kisun. And just as a reminder, if you got an email from us with an offer for a VIP ticket, and you're like, eh, why am I going to get a VIP ticket? What's the point of a VIP ticket? I want you to know that the village auntie did a private workshop for sisters on the pathways to pleasure where she broke it all down. And when I say all down, I mean all down. So you think that today was a lot? No, this was a private workshop where she took sisters through from A to Z. It is only available to VIPs. It's only available in private. It is not published on YouTube at all. It's one of those special private workshops. So if you want to access that, go to the link in your email, upgrade to VIP, and you will also get free access to Anissa Kisun's private workshop happening next weekend. Sister Anissa is going to be talking about sacred seduction. You know you don't want to miss that. So make sure that you upgrade, get the VIP ticket, and you'll be able to join us in the Zoom. But more importantly, you'll get access to bonus workshops and videos and a live session with Sister Anissa next weekend, inshallah. For now, I want to bid you all a good night. Jazakallah khairan for joining me. Tell your friends if you benefited. Put it on socials if you benefited. Tag me so that I can repost and let's get more people benefiting from this. You know, Sister Um Talha, she asked me, you know, what's your intention with this whole conference, with this conversation? Why are you doing this? And I said to her, at the end of the day, we want more happy couples. We want more happy Muslim men, more happy Muslim women, more people enjoying the barakah of the good things in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with in this life. We want more solid homes, inshallah, okay? We want more relaxed, happy couples. So if this has been beneficial to you, please do make dua for myself, for the speakers, and for everybody involved. And let's keep it moving. We'll see you guys, inshallah, tomorrow night. Be there or be square, as they say. Subhanakallahumma rabbana wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Wa astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. I'm out.